computer and my address, actually gave me my address in Dearborn. And I said, no, I'm not, which is a, a lie. Mm -hmm. And I s make a long story short, I said, he said, you t can you turn on your computer? I said, well, I, I'll have to turn it on. So I said, I'm turning it on, you know, I got a speakerphone next to it. I want to keep him on the line as long as I can, just out of revenge. <laughs> And he said, All right, is it, can you, have you just stop? I said, no, it takes 15 or 20 minutes for me to power up my computer. And then he says, 20 minutes, how long has that been going on in this thick accent? I said, oh, a couple of years. So um, he says, well, I'll wait. I said, fine, you wait. So I started reading the book and everything. And I got back and I said, I feel bad that you're waiting. Why don't you call me back? I'm not going to ask him for his phone number. And he says, well, I'm busy, but if you want my phone number, you can take it, you know? So he gave me an odd area code. I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I said, okay, I'll call you back in 15, 20 minutes once I get online. And then he said, thank you. Well, then I called Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I have their technic number from a couple years ago. They picked up right away. I didn't have to wait. I said, you have, well, first of all, this gentleman said he's a contract worker for Microsoft. Right. And that they're helping them out because my computer is sending false messages to their servers in certain areas of the United States and screwing them up, and they want to help clear mm -hmm. up the wow. server problem coming from my computer. Oh, nice. Yeah. So then this real nice guy from Microsoft, really articulate, said, that's bogus. Nobody is ever going to contact you that says they're working for Microsoft unless it's Microsoft and they give you this number that you call me on because we have certain numbers for, for random calls. Mm -hmm. We've got numbers for people that subscribe to our tech service and we got uh, retailers that come. Oh. So just ignore it. Well, he never called back and I never called that number back. But that's PayPal. Mm -hmm. the same thing like you said, they clip the logo and said my account's in error or something. But when I look at the email they want to reply me to, it's usually got a .uk or a Soviet Union type of description yeah. after the PayPal logo goes. Yes. Yeah. .ru is Russia. So. Yeah, something like yeah. that. You know. But so. I was going to ask you some specific things. Sure. Um, why don't you think that they, when you create a password, on a computer, that part of the requirement when you create that password is to type in the URL of your computer. That's a number that's very seldom used by people like me. The URL seems to be a key address. So once you register to a website like AOL or to whatever, Target, online, they demand that you put this computer that you've got, it's unique to that computer, that number. So whoever does ever get my password for Target, they would also have to have access to know that URL number in order to hack into that account of mine. Um, I'm going to guess you're talking about the IP address. IP address, okay. Because um, I have a different one for each computer. I have three computers. Yeah. They're not the same. Yeah. It's the, the dotted quad, you know, 177 dot, yeah. 204 dot, yeah. yeah. Make that an industry standard. It's just another fence that they'd have to sort of navigate. First of all, um, it's not constant. Generally speaking, your ISP can give you a different IP address from one time to another. In a lot of cases, the IP address is a non-routable, for internal use only, IP address. Um, but I think the biggest issue I would see is you are actually using information that you probably don't want to be putting out on the internet willy-nilly that is identified to you. I mean, if you're going to put a number onto something, a random number. Not just that, but your internet traffic, if even if you connect through a VPN or whatnot, they have a way of pulling 
not necessarily the information out of the packets that are traveling. They can pull the header information. They have all that information already. Okay, and like he was saying, the non-routable addresses, if you set up uh, a wireless router within your home or even a wired router, you can have as many machines hooked up to that, you know, is, you know up to like 254 machines. The way that the router works, you get one outside world IP address from your internet service provider. And on the inside, you can assign up to 254 addresses to any machines within your network. When your inside network leaves and goes to the outside world, every single computer on the inside looks like that one IP address because of network address translation. So at that point in time, if you have internal machines doing specific tasks, identifying things by an IP address, unless you are able to pull logs out of your router, you are never going to truly know who went where. I guess you could use a MAC address, but you wouldn't want to be giving that to everyone. No, no, <laughs> because at that point in time, you're, you're inviting MAC address spoofing and mm -hmm. anything else, yeah. you know, and then at that point in time, with wireless routers, you have the ability to lock it down in multiple ways. You can have your encryption passphrase that if you don't know my passphrase, you can't get on my network. Mm -hmm. You can turn off your SSID broadcast so that unless you know the name of the network and then you know the passphrase, you won't be able to get on. You can also lock it down a third way, saying, if you are not within this list of MAC addresses, I don't care what else you know, you're not getting on my network. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, if you're broadcasting a MAC address, you're opening yourself up to other issues. Because you know, we've been, uh, at, at my place of work, we've been tasked with installing some kind of a password manager solution, mm -hmm. not for a single user, but uh, for specific groups. So we've been looking at yeah. different solutions, uh, like Password Manager Pro, mm -hmm. um, open source wise, we've been looking at Radic. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that point in time, there was a big question, you know, okay, we're gonna install this on a server, do we want to encrypt the database, or do we not want to encrypt it? Well, a couple, once you, once you encrypt a drive, the only real way you are going to get benefit out of that encryption is if the drive is powered off. Because if you encrypt an entire server, when you boot that server on, you type in your encryption key so that the drive can be decrypted and the system can run normally. Mm -hmm. Encryption is great on a laptop hard drive because it is possible that somebody can steal it from you, you could lose it, mm -hmm. things of that nature. How often do you power off a server and transport it? You know, or, or how often do, does somebody yeah. that doesn't, you know, isn't allowed access into your server room, how often do people break in and steal things? Not that it never happens, but that's like winning the lottery of bad luck. Um, so, I mean, at that point in time, you, you look for things that, do they store your password values in the database and in a hashed value, something that's not going to be plain text. Yeah. Um, if it is, if you do decide to go to the route where it's not stored, encrypted, um, you know, who has access to that database? What users, you know, because we're going to be running it on a, a MySQL database. So at that point in time, what MySQL users have access to that database and what functions can they perform and then who within the teams of administrators or anything else who has the passwords so that when you log into MySQL you know what what functions do they play so it's there's no one it's out of control all. yeah there's there's no one end all be all solution it's just a matter of providing as many hurdles as possible. Yeah. There, there are, there are best practices, and most of the problems places get into are because they didn't do something that they sh that they should have done that was well known, 
Um, and, you know, there's a couple of places that I like to go to. One of them is the Sands Institute, and I know they have published, you know, here are all the things you should be doing if you're involved in security in a company. Uh, Sophos Security is another place I really like, and they have what they call the seven deadly sins, you know, the most common ways that companies mess that up. Uh, so, if, if you at least get those things taken care of, you're much less likely to get into trouble. It almost seems like you need the government to step in and create some kind of body that audits top yeah. Fortune 500 companies. And that's going to be hard to do because most generally the crimes are committed globally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so there are things that the you know that are required. You get to a large enough company, they're going to have their policies and they're going to yes. have enforcement Any rules, that deals with things like that. Numbers, you have your PCI compliance. Right. You, you know your healthcare industries have HIPAA. Uh, yeah. But there's no there's no all encompassing blanketed, and if if the United States comes up with things, with with these regulations and whatnot, mm -hmm. how do you make the rest of the world enforce them? I um, coming here, knowing I'm coming here, I, I went I did something, and uh, just the slant said that you were talking because the only really thing that I got out of this class, and I'm retired, you know, I'm not into computers. I, I use my computers for a lot of things, banking, stock brokerage, trading, so forth. And you have assets to protect. Yeah. So I thought, I, you're talking about protection, and the two things I got out of the class so far, I might think of another one, but I took some notes, mm -hmm. was one, the, the number of characters to make up a password. Mm -hmm. I think the most I have is eight. That's it. The second thing was the pass, the last pass. I never knew about that. Yeah. Now, I went to a certain location when I knew I was coming here to show mm -hmm. you what I go through. See this? Okay. This, this is an Excel document. Oh, one of those. Every one of these lines <laughs> is a website that I go to. Some of right. it is, is not so secure, neat, but a lot of it is. Mm -hmm. So I have my password and my user ID and my email mm -hmm. and I keep this in my safe deposit box at Coal America Bank. Okay. All right, now, uh, of course, it, it's cumbersome because sometimes I'm going at a coffee shop and I want to go to a not a high secure site, but I have a unique password for these sites. Every one's unique. So, my question now to you is, should I make it a policy to change my password for every one of these lines, which are different, once a month? What good does it do if I do? I, I, uh, I mean, it would take me an hour and a half. I don't. I, I don't see that that's, you know, one of the things that a lot of places do is in, and this is a one of those corporate things, you know, you must change your password every 60, 30, 90, whatever. 30 days, if 30 you can't days. use the last 10 that you've created. Right, and uh, <laughs> you know, Steve Gibson tells a story about a guy who worked in a place like that, and it was like, yeah, you, you can't use any of the last eight, so he just changed his password nine times in a row to get back to the one he liked. <laughs> Well, right. So there's there's advantages and disadvantages, and you know, you get to a big company that has policies and procedures and stuff. the The point really is that you have to, you know, describe what you're doing and have that reviewed. And you know, reasonable people will look at you know what your practice is and decide does that fit with our policy or not. And then you have to explain what you're doing, you know, that type of thing. So you get to the point where you have you know peers who review what you're doing and you understand you know, what the policies are and stuff. So is it every 90 days you're changing your password or is it once a year? Well, if it's a really critical type of thing, maybe you change it more often. If it's more likely you're going to cause problems by changing the password, then you're going to, you know, actually prevent from, from making changes. You know, all these little things should be uh, right. uh, based on, you know, the real needs and stuff. Uh, and, you know, critical but, thing is to have it reviewed. You know, the, the thing that I have always argued about with that is, have you taken psychology into account? Because, you know, there was, I was just reading the other day a story about uh, uh, pen testing. 
and the company brought, brought in a security outfit. And this guy from the security company just was walking around with a cell phone with a camera, just taking pictures and walk through the entire place doing that, and only one person in the entire company said, what the hell are you doing? All right. With a camera camera or like a phone just camera? Phone, phone camera. And, and if you hear the clicking, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you question anybody like that, because nope. at that point in time... Nobody, but only one person in the entire place even said anything, like, what are you doing? <laughs> now, if you... Uh, if you Tell people you must change your password. And Did that sound like a camera? Mm -mm. Not really. Yeah. Um, the. Um, Did to me because I have a Samsung. And, phone. and and let's say you know you you've put in a couple of other things. It has to be at least so many characters, and you know this is the character set. You have to you know must have at least one number and that kind of stuff. Uh, what will people do? Write them down. down? Sticky note on the monitor. Sticky note on exactly. the monitor. So the guy walking around with the camera is going to get it. And, uh, and so, you know, it's like, okay, what is the real net effect on security from forcing people to change the code? You, I, I've always argued you would get much better security if you insisted everyone have a really good password, memorize it, and stick with it. Yes. The only thing I thought of is when we're talking about groups capturing your packet data and then later deciphering it, in that case, it would be good to have a new password. By the time they were able to crack your password, 90 days have passed, your password is but, but it, But it also, I, that's a good point, but more often than not, and, and most security officers and security departments don't look at it this way, stop fighting human nature. Um, when I worked for HP, it was mandatory that all employees took little online security courses. Mm -hmm. here's, here's rules for good, strong passwords. Uh, do's and don'ts with your company-issued cell phone. Do's and don'ts with your company-issued laptop. Mm -hmm. if, if you take into account human nature and you teach people how to make strong, secure passwords, and maybe say, you know what? change it once a year, if you change it every 60 days, every 90 days, and then say you can't use the last 10 passwords that you've used, at that point in time, you're asking for the supply closet to be robbed of all the sticky notes. <laughs> and it's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and people, okay, well, I have my sticky note on the bottom of my laptop, so people can't get into it. You know, they, they, it's not visible. Yeah. Or on the bottom of my mm -hmm. mouse pad, it's not visible. Right. So I just wanted to mention um, all of the presentations that I do are Creative Commons licensed, which basically have at it. <laughs> so uh, they didn't hear that. Uh, Creative Commons is a licensing, and um, so the the license that I use basically says. Um, if you want to grab a copy, go ahead, but share it with other people the same way I shared it with you. And if you use it uh, for any reason, just mention my name. You know, hey, I got this from Kevin O'Brien. And that's really all I ask, those two things, you know. Give you a little bit of credit, and so that's what's called an attribution share alike license in Creative Commons. Now, uh, I have got a bunch of different presentations available on my site. They're all also up on SlideShare. Um, so. But this one, if you wanted to come back and, and review it, it's freely available. So. And the videos I will be putting on YouTube. Yep. Um, check out, uh, get onto our mailing list, the MDLUG Club that sort of is helping to sponsor this, mdlug.org. MD Yes. L U G. So Metro Detroit Linux User Group dot org. Uh, and so we have a, a mailing list and the mailing list, you know, is pretty active on technical computer stuff. 
Um, so, you know, some people might say it's a little bit more technical than the general public type of stuff. But uh, the point is that at some point I'll post this, uh, you know, video out on that uh, list. On YouTube? I put it out on YouTube and then I mm -hmm. post it to the email list. You could probably search for yep. MD Lug or something yep. on YouTube. So if I go to Last Pass, is it easy for me to create the account and oh, yeah. load all my other lines in that Excel document? In? Here's, what, here's the way you do it. Okay. First, you install the extension into your browser. So, if, if, what browser do you like to use? Internet Explorer or Chrome. Okay. Uh, and I do not have Internet Explorer on this computer because it's a Linux computer. I do have Chrome. But with Chrome, um, you know, you go to the what's called the hamburger menu, the three lines and click that and then go into the settings and I think it's called extensions or something like that. Yeah, or you can go to lastpass.com and they have, they'll recognize what browser you're using okay. and it'll have the install button for the browser that you're using. All right. And LastPass is free to use on a laptop or a desktop. If you want to use it on your mobile phone, on a smartphone, then it's $12 a year right now. If I got three laptops, do I have to go three times to LastPass to register those laptops? No, so the first time when you install it, it'll ask you to create an account. And then on the other computers, you'll just go to LastPass.com just to download the installer. And then once you've got it installed, you can use the same account that you created the first time. Okay, so as I, if I understand it, Kevin, if I do this successfully on LastPass, yeah. in the future, every time I go to a website that asks me for a pass, Word? LastPass will, you, you're putting in a password, it's, it's, LastPass will see that this has come up, and it'll pop up at that point and say, hey, you know, um, what's going on? Is this something I should be helping you with? So um, my AOL's password I would put in, or the same password on all my sites? Now. Yeah, well, if you've already got the password, you just yeah. type it in, and then LastPass will say, do you want me to remember this? Okay, all right. Um, so in this version of Chrome, it's in the uh, the hamburger menu, more I, tools. I, I've never heard of a hamburger menu. <laughs> it, it's because it's the three horizontal lines. So it's like the hamburger between the two pieces of bun. It's like the only button on it's the under right tools. Side. More tools. Okay. More tools. And then more tools lead you to extensions. So what I do is I just I install the extension and then say, I open the extension up, and at that point it says, if it's the first time, it'll tell me I need to create an account. Um, if it's on another computer, I can just say, no, I've already got an account, thank you. Here's my account, please connect them. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the free version is fine for computers. Uh, for $12 a year, um, I like having it available on my phone. So I didn't know it was going to cost me to have it on my phone. I didn't pay anything, and so I must be on like the three-month free trial thing or something. Uh, I don't know. I just so at some point it's going to lock me out. You know, <laughs> delete your account. Uh, <laughs> well, I keep getting the the nagware from another uh, yeah. password uh, management software, and I just you know say no, and it, it lets me continue. What they want to do is have you pay so you can back it up, right? Um, oh, you use Keeper. <laughs> that's what I use on my phone, and it's always like, yep. you're not protected. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, you know, and it's like, you know, so well, if, I, if I lose my phone, I lose my stuff. And it's part like, uh, part of fun. the reason, uh, you know, first of all, I, I can afford $12 a year. It's, it's not nice that big a deal. It's nice to support them, and you know that it's still going to be around. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, stuff that I rely on, I, I want to be there. It's the same reason I, I donate to a number of open source projects. It's like, okay, I use this stuff. It's got to be supported. Mm -hmm. You know, there was an interesting situation just really came out in the last couple of months about uh, the, uh, the GPG encryption software that it was this one guy in Germany that had written it and was supporting it and he was going broke. And it's like, 
well, we all use that. And finally, uh, that got picked up in, I think it was an article in ProPublica or something that went viral. And all of a sudden, people realized, wait a minute, we, <laughs> this guy is about to, you know, he was all set to say, well, screw it, I'm getting out of it, right around the time Edward Snowden released the stuff and was using GPG. And he said, oh, okay, I can't quit now. Mm -hmm. But uh, fortunately, you know, a bunch of people stepped up and, and he's now funded, but that's, you know, we, you know, developers got to eat. Yeah. I got families. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think I got one last question. In order sure. To me though. When I worked at Chrysler in engineering, he gave me a corporate laptop. He also gave me a little stick called a BPM stick. Mm -hmm. If I tra want to travel internationally or anywhere, if yeah. I wanted to access the, cor the corporate network right. from my la company laptop, sure. I would be have to put the VPN uh, thing into the USB port. Exactly. Yeah. And so why doesn't that isn't that used universally by everybody? Well, let me jump in. Money. Let me jump in with a quick story on that. There was a company that was providing services like that. And, you know, large company had this whole thing where everybody had these little fobs and stuff. And the company that provided that service got hacked. So <laughs> it's like, yep. oops. So that through that? Yeah, RSA um, is a, a famous one. But uh, the concept was virtual, it? yes, it's what's virtual. called a virtual private network, right. VPN. Right. Um, and what that does is it creates an encrypted connection between two points so that all the data that travels over it is secure. I think they're wonderful. I have one. Okay, you can, you know, you can buy one inexpensively, uh, which is what I did, and for most people is probably the best way to do it. Um, you know, you, you, I think earlier you said something about sitting in a coffee shop. I would yeah. not want to be like talking to my broker online in a coffee shop. I don't talk to them, but I do look at. Uh, yeah, but you do you log in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm telling you, it is trivial, and I know how to do it to sit in that coffee shop mm -hmm. with a piece of equipment that would let me look at all of your traffic and get your login and your password and all of that because it's unsecured. Yeah. So there's a whole thing about uh, you know how are you connecting, right? So. If you're using Wi-Fi that has a connection that is encrypted, that's better than one that is not encrypted. And there's different ways of connecting. And some of the older equipment had a default, was it WPA? Was that what it was called? Uh, that was, that That's since been, you know, found to be not very good. And, you right. know, so everybody has moved up to a, a newer, higher level of I, encryption. I, this Today I use WPA2. That's, that's PA2? Yeah, that's for my, for my home Wi-Fi router. Yeah. It is secured with a I, password. I have that. Uh... And, yeah, the, the two things that, um, I mean, there are several good things. One is to have a good password to secure it. Another one is to change the name. It's what's called an SSID. Yeah. Um, and all of the browsers ship with a default one. You should change it. Most uh, routers come with um, an admin account that you can log in to make changes, change the name of the admin account, change the password of the admin account, because all of these are default standards and the bad guys know that. So they get on the internet and they go looking for, oh, Here's another one that says Linksys. I wonder if they bothered to change anything else. Or, or and, and you, and go it, into, you go into you this. I things I've done that just from this. Sure. And at that point in time, I can go into your network settings, and I can shut off your network. I can dictate the times you are allowed to use your network. <laughs> go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so one of the things they do, they, they can go into a restaurant and start up a service, basically a Wi-Fi hotspot, with a, a name that's common like Linksys, and anybody coming in will, you know, the, the, if their device is set up to connect automatically to Linksys, they will connect to that device, and they could be what they call well, man in the middle, and he see everything. Even better, because what uh, devices like your laptops, your tablets, your phones, or whatever remember Wi-Fi networks they've connected to before. So what you may not realize is they're broadcasting most of the time, saying, "Hey, is this network around?" 
So you, I can sit there in a coffee shop with Yassiger, and with that nice little piece of software and a nifty little bit of equipment, I, I can basically respond to that and say, why, yes, I happen to be that very network. <laughs> I'd be happy to help you. How far range does that little device go? Oh. Can they sit in a parking lot in a car and pick you up? You can. I, it depends. Yeah, I think a lot so. of 